Hello and welcome to the big picture. After over three decades, a US Vice President has made an official visit to India. It is said that unlike in the past when US Vice Presidents were largely inconsequential and more decorative, they are no more so in recent years. So Joe Biden's ongoing visit has received more attention both in India and US. Biden, who had meetings with all the important Indian dignitaries, has sought to iron out the stresses and strains which have developed in the relationship between India and US in the recent times. His stress on India and US relations and his statement that it is not just important for the two countries but also to the world emphasizes the increasing role for India. What does the visit of Vice President Joe Biden to India mean to the relations between the two countries? How will it help in improving the ties which have been affected? What is it that he has said and done in the last two days which can make a difference? Has he been able to arrest the drift in the relations? We will discuss all this today with Lalit Man Singh, former Indian ambassador to the United States and also foreign secretary, Commodore Uday Baska, senior fellow National Maritime Foundation, Prabir Purkayasta of the Delhi Science Forum and Sandeep Dikshit, senior assistant editor of the Hindu. Welcome to all of you. Uh, and also, we are also joined on the phone line from Washington, D.C. by Chidanand Rajgata, the Foreign Affairs Editor of the Times of India and also its U.S. Correspondent. Welcome to all of you, uh, Mr. Man Singh. Uh, this Vice President's visit, do we take it as more important than, than what we normally would take a U.S. Vice President's visit? Yes, Has I think, he become more significant? I, I, think, I think it's an important visit, not just because he's Vice President, but... Uh, after Obama, uh, there are only two very powerful voices in the U.S. policy making on foreign policy. Uh, the Secretary of State, uh, Kerry. Kerry, and uh, Vice President Joe Biden. The fact that they are making back-to-back -back back visits to, back, to yes. India. Just shows, last month, Kerry was here. This is to uh, give a big boost to what is perceived as a flagging relationship. Right. And so it is a serious effort by the U.S. administration to reassure India that the relationship matters. Okay. Uh, we, we, let me get uh, Chidanand Rajagata in on this. Ch Chidanand, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lalit Man Singh thinks that you know, this is very important. And, you know, this, this, this feeling that the relationship between the two countries have been flagging and this visit is, that's why, very important, especially coming on the uh, heels of uh, John Kerry's visit. Is, is this the way it is perceived in the U.S. also? Yes, it is. In fact, uh, it's got quite a bit of uh, coverage uh, in the U.S. You know, uh, the, the, the joke is that in the past, uh, vice presidents usually went abroad uh, only to attend funerals. Um, yeah, and it's, it's, it's very true. You know, the last uh, vice president I can recall who visited India, um, you know, Dan Quayle came for uh, Rajiv Gandhi's funeral and uh, George Bush Sr. came for Indira Gandhi's funeral. Um, but after the 90s, the vice presidents took on uh, an important role in U.S. policy making. Um, uh, both Al Gore uh, and uh, the previous vice president, Dick Cheney, were fairly powerful right. vice presidents, very influential, uh, unlike their predecessors. And I, I don't recall either of them coming to India. Uh, but uh, Joe Biden is actually uh, quite an extraordinary figure in the sense that he's not just a vice president, but uh, like Lalit said, also a very influential uh, foreign policy uh, uh, specialist in, in uh, the U.S. Uh, for many, many years, he's been in the, on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He's one of the senior most uh, senators. Uh, he became a senator when he was 29 right. and served six terms. So he, he's a very powerful figure. And, um, you know, beyond being vice president, he's been a very important voice uh, in foreign policy and in, in, in the U.S.-India dialogue. So um, for a change, instead of <laughs> coming for funerals, uh, here's a vice president who actually came to infuse uh, some life uh, into a relationship. I wouldn't say the relationship was flagging, but definitely there are uh, you know, s several uh, sort of issues between the two countries. And I think it's a very important visit, and I think uh, um, uh, India treated it as much. Okay. Um, Prabir, do you see it in the, in the same fashion that the visit of uh, U.S. Vice President to India? And, you know, some of the important points he has made, two, three important points, th four important points. In fact, they've all been speaking about the defense cooperation, climate change is one of the things which he says. And, you know, economic times, of course, uh, ec economic ties and, and also the um, India's role in the Asia-Pacific. These are four issues which, has, which has been flagged by them. 
Do you think that this this visit will will make any difference in any of these areas? I think there are some fundamental issues which really at one level put India's relationship with the United States under strain. And of course, the other part of it is that the economic uh, issues yes. and the fact that India's economy is right now flagging and that itself is not going to be solved by inviting more FDIs as the government seems to think. Of course, the FDIs also came as a response to what Kerry's visit had done. Right. I would say that as far as the fundamental issue that you're raising, India, how it views itself and how it views the United States in the geostrategic context right. of Asia. That's the key issue for Absolutely. me. And of course, the other issue, which I think is also continuously an irritant, which is the intellectual property right, the TRIPS issues, uh, which the United States keeps on saying, bringing up with some bilateral pressure on a WTO issue, yeah. which I don't think is a forum for it. If they have a problem with India's intellectual property rights, they can go to the WTO dispute res uh, settlement board, which they don't want to do, and they want to put bilateral pressure. So I think these are the some of the issues. I do see this it's more of an in pressure by the United States continuously than it wants to put on India on economic issues and strategic issues, India is the one who really needs to get some understanding of what it wants to do with the United States because that's not clear to, to me at the moment what this plan, strategic vision is. Strategic vision. In fact, it's very interesting. Let me get uh, Uday Bhaskar in on this. Uday Bhaskar, it's very interesting on this strategic vision and uh, the issue of strategic, uh, you know, the, the strategic issues. He, Mr. Joe Biden today has made a very interesting statement in Bombay saying that strategic autonomy and strategic partnership, there, is, there need not be any contradiction between the two. You think that's the way India also sees this? Especially in the context of, you know, the Americans being well, very... I don't think... Especially in the context of Americans wanting India to be uh, part of this whole, you know, they're looking at India as a partner when it comes to Asia-Pacific issues and things like that. Well, I think the way in which the Vice President, Mr. Biden, has characterized it, that strategic autonomy and a strategic partnership are not incompatible, right. has been the American position. Because if you look at the articulation over the last five years, ever since the 2008 Civilian Nuclear Cooperation Agreement was concluded, the United States has repeatedly said, that they would like a more robust partnership with India while respecting and being cognizant of India's own position that it is not in favor of any kind of military alliance. Right. But as Mr. Purkayasta has just said, I think the decision is still to be made in India, meaning that from 2008 till now, I would make the point as an analyst that the Indian political establishment is still hesitant, reluctant, or unable to come to a determination about how it wants to engage with the United States. And this, again, I would say in the long run, is going to be detrimental to India's own strategic interests. But that is a completely different kind of, shall we say, story that we'll have to track. But just now, I think what Mr. Biden has said is a very familiar American formulation. And the ball is very much in India's court. And the fact that we have not been able to arrive at the determination about how we want to engage with the United States. And we have just retreated into this, what I would call as safe haven of strategic autonomy. And that for a country which is critically dependent on every significant aspect of its military inventory is important. So to think that we are preserving strategic autonomy while we import our critical equipment from the rest of the world is in itself a bit of an oxymoron, but that's a debate that the Indian political class and the strategic community would have to engage yes, in. Yes, yes, and we, 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 did have, we did have one of these debates recently, you were also there. Anyway, uh, the very interesting thing, what you have said, let me get uh, Sandeep in on. Sandeep, in yeah. the last two days that he has been, that uh, the Vice President has been here, what kind of an atmosphere did you perceive between the two, you know, when, when these talks were taking place and how is the Indian foreign office, how is the Indian government looking at this visit? Um, it depends on how you look at it. If you compare it with about a year back when Hillary Clinton came here for the strategic dialogue, uh, she was speaking about FDI and retail and she said that India, uh, US had been pressuring them a lot. 
So if we see from there, then if there's FDI in retail, then recently there was FDI in a whole lot of uh, sectors so that, is, yes. that was allowed. And then the preferential market access policy, India withdrew the notification of that policy to keep in with American wishes. So the American desire for greater economic engagement with India has been met to a large extent. But there are largely four laws that are really inhibiting all of this. One law is the Navartis judgment which the Supreme Court gave, so the Government of India can't do anything. Second is the nuclear liability law and uh, Westinghouse will have to work its way around that nuclear liability law. And then there are two laws that hit the Indians also. One is the proposed immigration law, immigration. which uh, imposes a higher visa fees on software professionals from India going to work in Indian software companies in the United States. And then there's the Defense Technology Initiative, right. which India and the US, with India wanting to enter into a technological tie-up, and there are various uh, American laws that have to be sorted out by the Washington over there. So, so there's a lot of work in progress, in fact. And uh, as uh, Mr. Mansingh has pointed out, we've got to see it as a hop, step and jump. So you had Mr. John Kerry last month, you have Mr. Biden this month, and in September you have Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh meeting the US President Barack Obama. So if uh, this is taken in that context, one would say, yeah, on the economic side, it's a mixed bag. On the strategic side, um, there is work in progress on a whole lot of issues that are going on. In, on, the, uh, on India's eastern flank, one would say India-US partnership has progressed a lot. India has got entry into very close uh, American allies such as South Korean defense, able to strike nuclear and defense partnership with Korea, defense with uh, Japan. But on the western side, there's disagreement on how the U.S. is handling so Afghanistan that, and so Syria. So any, any of these major disagreement, uh, the areas of disagreement, you think has been sorted out to any extent in this during this visit? Well, uh, one would expect uh, more work to go on on this, especially on the Westinghouse thing, on the Westinghouse front, because when Mr. John Kerry came here last month, he had hoped that by September, both sides would be able yes. to sign a commercial agreement. But on the other four issues, as I mentioned, they're laws. And these are laws where one would have to work your way around those laws, try to observe them, but at, at the same time, hope some from, for some flexibility. Okay. Mr. Mansingh, uh, I, I want to draw attention to what uh, Uday Bhaskar was saying about the strategic autonomy th thing. He says that India is still not clear what it wants. Do you agree with well, that? I, I, I completely agree with him. You know, uh, India wants to get the latest and the best defense technology which is there in the United States. So while we are anxious to get it, every time they sell us something, we say strategic autonomy will take our own decisions. Don't pressurize us. So that's a contradiction that needs to be resolved. But in all fairness, I would say, Mr. Biden has focused on areas of differences which have cropped up recently. Right. And on the foreign policy front, there are two uh, areas he has focused on in terms of our regional interests. Right. One is Afghanistan. Yes. The other is the Look East policy of right. India and how it meshes. In, in fact, he has, said that, he has said that the Look East policy is beneficial to the relation. To the exactly. Uh, that's, that's the point that he made at the... Uh, dinner which the Vice President hosted last, it, night, last night, that uh, this in fact fits into their, scheme of their own policy of rebalance towards Asia. Right. That we are actually working together to have greater stability in the region. And that's the point that he was making. On Afghanistan, uh, we have been at, uh, there have been serious differences. And India is not quite happy at the way the talks with the Taliban are going. Right. You know, it started off with Americans saying there are three red lines that the Taliban must, must accept. Yes. And India went along with that. And now the Americans are saying these are not preconditions, these are outcomes. And here there is a, a, a more than a nuanced difference. Right. And we needed reassurances from the Americans a, on what they mean and how you what it you, means. You, you think there was some kind of an assurance to, uh, by, by, by and, on, on an that explanation? Point? Because, mind you, uh, Vice President Biden is a very powerful voice right. in U.S. policy towards Afghanistan. He's had definite policies and sometimes they were a little out of line with what President Obama has been saying. But all said and done, he's part of the establishment. Right. And therefore, something that he would explain on Afghanistan would make much more sense to our policy makers. But do you think he has made any such explanation? Well, uh, they, they consistently maintain now that these three so-called conditions uh, uh, which give they seem violence, to have abandoned for, for give up violence uh, snap ties with the al-qaeda and respect the afghan constitution
for the americans these are no longer preconditions <laughs> they think they are going to be outcomes but you don't expect the taliban to subscribe to them at the beginning right uh, we have some reservations about that but i think this is also work in progress and we have to see okay prabir i want i want you to address one of the issues many issues, i'm sure you you want to respond to all all of them you can do that greater stability india us relations will you know with especially the look east policy and all that will bring greater stability to the region this is the you know let's understand the underlying statements that are being made essentially india wants to work with the united states in the united states view to contain china that's the look east policy of the united states containment of china of course they will engage with china economically in a big way as well as militarily contain china and india is actually becoming in this sense a partner to the us strategy on ch containment of china in this region which i do not think is a long term goal of stability or is a really long term uh, outcome would be stability but that aside leaving that aside when it comes to west asia and particularly uh, iran issue as well as afghanistan united states and india have different strategic objectives is very clear that there has been a discontinuity of uh, visions on that we do not agree and the indian government has been really not forthcoming on what it should do instead of looking after its national interest in which, which case was oil and gas from iran it's really sub succumbed to american pressure in different ways even talking of a turkmenistan pipeline as you know last point which is the big elephant in the room nobody is talking about here you have an nsa disclosures snowden's uh, disclosures which are there indian embassy being bugged <laughs> the prime minister's delegation the g20 being bugged and the indian establishment is unwilling to say this is not done that you cannot have indian you cannot have hacking of our network telecom network all other things on such a large scale and yet we do not want to talk about it by the way two indian companies have signed agreements with the us government giving it access to its network from the us side and they are not even supposed to disclose what they have given to the us even that is to be kept secret from the government of india as well as its own board of directors let me let me get this is the this is the conversation to my thing initially you had reservations for what you were saying Please. later you were smiling yes yeah uh, Uh, there's yeah. another point also there's this status of force agreement that the us wants to do with the maldives right. and that i think uh, india would uh, be very careful about it i don't know if the foreign office in india were taken into confidence about this Mr. but you, if you remember that uh, no, india Sandeep, once upon a time threw a fit when uh, sri lanka was trying to get used by the americans and the british right mr man singh yeah I, look I, if you get into the espionage part of it then i think we're going to derail the discussion let's focus on the biden visit and the points that he made first of all our look east policy and the american pivot or rebalance or whatever they call it actually have the same objective the objective being that they are confronting an increasingly belligerent china and it's a process of consultation amongst the countries of the region how to deal with it now we don't like the americans telling us that we should identify china not do the americans like us identifying china we are both following a policy of hedging exactly but let's make no mistake it is in our common interest to keep an eye on what china is up to and we'll be the more immediate victims as we have seen what is happening on the border so keeping quiet about china is not certainly not in india's na national interest so you think that the, the the line being adopted now is the right line i think it's the right line I mean which of course it's not in our interest to say we want to contain china nobody wants it but to uh, in, pretend in that china public, is not a pub, factor public discourse all three all three all three have to work no, together and, and you know, it's, it's all wrong, those goody goody things are it's being wrong said. to think that the americans are pressurizing us oh, that, to okay. join them against china I, it is as much as in our interest to keep an eye on china right and let me let i i want to get with my basket but before that i let me go to chidanand chidanand do you do yes. is the is the is this the perception there in united states also that it's in the interest of both india and and us to you know to adopt the kind of policy which we are adopting now as far as you know this look east policy and in uh, and what they are talking about yeah i think on the look east uh, uh, broadly we are on the same uh, page uh, i i don't know though uh, that both sides want to uh, openly say that uh, you know part of it uh, uh, part of the policy is uh, containing china 
Uh, but listen, uh, I, I just want to step back and you know say that in, in, in terms of the big picture, U.S.-India relations is a work in progress, and it's always going to be a work in progress. You know, people who expect total convergence, complete consonance on all issues, are not going to get it. You know, over over years, over decades, over generations, we'll always disagree on many many issues, and we'll agree on some. You know, you win some, you lose some. Um, and it, it goes back all the way to, you know, even when we had the nuclear deal, for instance, you know, we, we got, we, we had our way on the nuclear deal. The Americans uh, didn't get as much as they wanted out of it. And after getting the nuclear deal, we still didn't, didn't end up buying, I mean, one of the first things that happened after the nuclear deal was we ended up buying French jet fighters. <laughs> so it shows that there's a certain degree of strategic, um, you know, autonomy we do exercise. It's not always that we roll over and play doggo to Americans. And then, you know, when you, when you come to something like Afghanistan, for instance, the Americans have their view, and within Washington, there are a lot of differences on, you know, how to deal with the Taliban. Okay. It's not a uniform view. Uh, Joe Biden has a particular view. In fact, uh, Joe Biden is often not on the same page uh, as his president. So th- these are, and this is a healthy thing. This is what, you know, democracy is all about. These are, these are what democratic countries deal with all the time in trying to bridge or narrow differences. Um, and uh, with the U.S. and India, this is going to happen all the time. On the trade, for instance, again, right. uh, you know, the Americans are putting great pressure on us to roll back uh, some of the things we think uh, is in our interest. Uh, we sort of uh, um, backtracked a little bit on, on, the, on the PMA issue, the preferential market uh, issue, um, by ro- rolling back the notification uh, to buy, uh, you know, an advisory to buy only domestic products. But on the IPR issue, for instance, on intellectual property rights, yes. particularly in the pharmaceutical sector, we've been very firm and uh, told the Americans, if you want, if you have a problem, go to the WTO. So, right, uh, but but the, but the pressure, as Prabir says, the pressure is constantly there to, to you know work out a bilateral deal. When it is there, oh, yeah, absolutely. The pressure is always going to be there. But listen, you're a country of 1.2 billion people. I mean, we're not going to just say, okay, there's pressure, so we'll sign up with that. There are any number of issues, any number of uh, times, places I can think of where, you know, the government of India has just stood very firm. And even for FDI, for instance, it's not as if it happened as soon as Americans snapped their finger. It's been very slow. It's been very deliberative. Uh, we have debated a lot within India to the point of, uh, you know, it's like pulling, you know, teeth. To the point, to the so, point that, to the point that none, none of the FDI in multiple and retail has started yet. Anyway, yeah. uh, right, uh, Chidu, I'll come back to you. Uh, Uday Bhaskar, some of the issues raised by Prabir, you know, I want you to react to that. And also this whole uh, issue of the civil nuclear uh, initiative. Do you think any, any progress can be made in the... In, in, because you you spoke about you know Kerry saying that in September we will we'll need to sign this. You know on the civil nuclear, as you rightly observed, it appears that people are looking at September as a possible date by which there would be some kind of movement. My own reading is that it will take a little longer time because, as we all know, the current political dynamic in Delhi does not allow for any speedy movement as far as the liability bill is concerned. We have to see the liability in the context of post Bhopal from the Indian perspective and post Fukushima at the larger global level. And therefore, I think in as much as the government of India has tried to assuage the concerns of suppliers like Westinghouse and even said that certain clauses could also be embedded in the original cost. My reading is that September may be too early, but I think as far as India is concerned, and I think one of our panelists had pointed this out, that in 2008, the way I see it, I think India got almost everything that it was looking for as far as that closure was concerned. And the biggest thing was political and strategic that the technological fetters imposed on India at U.S. initiative, had been removed again at U.S. behest. I mean, that was a very big deal. But that having been said, I think it was not just about nuclear. It was about India's ability to access a much wider range of American technology. And this is where I think the diffidence on the Indian part 
is frankly cause for concern because but there, but we concluded the US India civilian nuclear deal in 2008 and now UPA2 is about to finish its second tenure right. and we still do not have clarity about how do we want to engage with the US and I agree with what most of the panelists have said that we will have differences with the United States. Okay. You have to look at Iran, you have to look at Pakistan, you have to look at Afghanistan. Okay. We have differences, okay. but we must work on those areas where we have the shared long-term interest. But uh, Mr. Mansingh, there is also this complaint against the US that you know they are not liberalizing the technology transfer regime and that is also one of the major problems between the two countries. That is true. That is true that there have been problems in the transfer of technology and these high-level visits are to reassure India that they are working on it and they will make it easier. I think the Americans have given up the idea that we need to sign foundational agreements before they agree to transfer technology. I think a number of high-level visits uh, have taken place where they have taken the line that it is not necessary to force India to sign them because India will not sign them. Okay. Which, which, which is, Prabir? Well, don't, you know, you think, don't you think at least there is somewhere that they, that we have been able to pull, put pressure on them and you know have, have our own way as Chidanand was saying? You see, as far as the nuclear agreement is concerned, it India got really relaxation on the fuel count. That's a concrete achievement India did get and I'm not going to, though I was an opponent of the indigenous <laughs> nuclear deal as you know, so I'm not going to uh, get away and I will not uh, pray, deny, that. deny that. But the point remains that technology regime really stays as it was. This is the reality, we said it at that time, let's not oversell the agreement, this is what it was all about. As far as the nuclear reactors are concerned, let's be very clear, the nuclear liability it's not a bill, it's an act of parliament, and there is no way the government can resile from that. That's the act on the statutes today. And the U.S. government and the U.S. companies want Indian government to change an act of parliament. It's not going to be possible. Mr. So Man that's the bottom line. Well, the second yeah. part of it, I think that's also very important. The cost of these reactors are prohibitively high. And once these costs come out, with the background of Fukushima and all that has happened, I doubt that the nuclear power is going to be techno-economically feasible Mr. with important reactors. Mr. Mr. Quickly, quickly. No, quickly, I, I think partly he's right that uh, the nuclear liability law can't be changed. Yes. Yeah. But uh, let's not get into the debate of whether nuclear power is good or bad. Let's keep that aside no, that for the time. Really keep it aside. Yes. Well, what is now happening is the Westinghouse Agreement is not going to resolve the nuclear liability issue. It is going to skirt around it and have what is what we should regard as a working agreement to take the early steps towards establishing uh, American reactors in India. What we have been telling them is that, look, the Russians are going ahead, the French are French going man. ahead. They also have the same reservations. Right. But let's, let's get this let's, going. Let's let this going. Let, let's get this going and deal with the issues as we go along. Okay. I think on that note, we have to end the, because we completely run out of time. It, it has been a very interesting discussion. The visit to the U.S. Vice President has, has been taken note of quite more than what normally would have been done. We will, he's here for another day. We'll see, wait and watch what he does. Thanks to all my guests, Mr. Lalit, Lalit Man Singh, Prabir Purkayastha, Chidanand Rajgata, Uday Baskar and Sandeep Dixit. Please keep watching. We'll come back with another issue on the big picture same time tomorrow.